Welcome in folks, five core subjects to speak about in today's video. First off, we have a problem, it's getting worse. We're gonna speak about that, what the ramifications are for the market, what I'm planning on doing in this situation. We'll go through all that in depth at the top of this video, okay? Second thing we're gonna get into is Tesla. I wanna speak about Tesla briefly here, then we'll get into Palantir, some rumblings around Palantir that we'll speak about in today's video. Then we'll speak about Nike, and then we'll speak about Wind Resorts, some great news in regards to Wind Resorts that came out here today, okay? So, a bunch of stuff to get into in this video here today. As always, all I need from you guys is smash that like button, and especially today, because it's April Fool's Day, and everybody and their grandma is doing April Fool videos, okay? I didn't do one for you guys in the, the reaction channel today. I didn't do one for you on this channel. It's just content as usual, okay? So make sure you smash that like button for your man here for not trying to do an April Fool's video here today. And speaking about April Fool's, this is no April Fool's joke, folks. We got the one-day sale coming up here in 13 days. 69 bucks taxes to my number one course ever, Become Master of Stock Market. See the moves I'm making in my Patreon portfolio each week, plus be part of that Patreon Discord chat. It's usually $125 for access to that. It's 69 bucks. Pinned comment down there. Enter in your info. We'll send that deal over as as soon as it drops, you need that deal, okay? So make sure you click the pin comment down there, okay? So first off, let's get in this problem we have, and we do have a problem indeed. First off, I'm starting out at lumber, and it'll make sense after I go through all these commodities here. I just want to show you kind of what's going on, and then we'll speak about the ramifications and what this means overall, okay? So lumber year-to-date is already up about five percentage points, which isn't great news, obviously. For home building or anything like that, lumber is used, especially in the United States, as pretty much the main construction project for homes, apartments, all those sorts of things in the United States of America, right? And so lumber going up, never a great thing. If we look at the past one year, lumber is up 58%. This can definitely, definitely lead to, guess what? Real estate inflation, okay? Housing inflation. Look at something like coffee. I mean, who doesn't drink coffee, it seems like, right? Coffee, up only 2% in the past year, year to date. It's like, okay, coffee's not doing that much. Well, Back it up a little bit. Look at the last six months. In the last six months, coffee's up 31%. 31%, folks, okay? This is the type of stuff that should definitely, uh, is definitely worth looking at, okay? Look at coca. Are you flipping my flabjacks? Are we talking chocolate or are we not? Oh, my gosh. Ye this is year-to-date, folks. We've been through three months so far. We just entered April. Year-to-date, coca's up 100 and 46%, oh my gosh. On a six-month basis, coca is up 201%. I don't even know how that's possible. Literally, I don't even know how that's possible. 201%? Get ready to pay crazy prices for Halloween chocolates this year. You're a big baller if you can afford the Hershey's bars this year, okay? and Reese's peanut butter cups and Kit Kats and all that stuff because I'm telling you, the prices are going to be silly, silly come Halloween. And guess what? All the production really happens in the spring and summertime. You might think they, they wait till September, October to make the chocolates. No, they're doing a lot of that in the spring and summertime, getting ready for a uh, big chocolate season when everybody's buying in September and October. Folks, this is a problem. If you look at WTI, year-to-date already up 16%, right? Summer's coming, folks, right? Summer's always the time you got to worry about WTI. And so this really concerns me up 16% plus already year-to-date. If we look at GSG, the commodity basket, you know, commodity index in general, it's already double-digit percentages. Once again, we just entered the fourth month of the year, and it's already up double-digit percentage, up over 10% year-to-date already for GSG. No bueno. Gold is up 22% in the past six months, which is a pretty huge move. Now, gold is having a nice bull run right now, which is a little scary, all-time highs, right? Because gold actually had a big bull run going right into the Great Recession. It actually peaked right here in January of 2008, right? And then it fell with all assets in general. It didn't fall quite as dramatically as other assets did, like stocks and real estate, but it fell. So, you know, I don't know. Sometimes when gold's going on a big bull run, I kind of like thinking, ooh, what's, what's coming down the, the road here, right? GSG, here we are. I mean, who's to say this baby's not going to see all-time highs this summer, right? Imagine oil. Imagine we have a big, you know, oil rise in the springtime and we go into summer and we're already over $100 a barrel, which isn't crazy far-fetched at this point in time. Oh, my gosh. 
right? Could GSG see new all-time highs or new at least multi-year highs or something like that? It's a potential. Now, you may say, okay, so where's all this going? Like, where, where's all this problem, right? Okay, all these commodities are going up. Well, hopefully that, that's like, you know, should be some sort of common sense there. Like, uh, guess what? Prices are going to be going up on a whole vast, like everything I just pretty much took you through are massive needs in the economy. Lumber, <laughs> coffee, coca, like these sorts of things, oil, right? Like, like that should be self-explanatory, but it's bigger than that. It's even bigger than that, right? Here's the deal, right? This is just out of, you know, a week or two ago, Fed sees three rate cuts in 2024, but a more shallow easing path, right? But here's the deal. What if oil and commodities run in this summer, right? This is going to create all types of ramifications for the Fed in the back half of the year, specifically more in late Q3, Q4, which then puts into jeopardy when the Fed starts cutting and how many times they cut, right? And if for any reason they were to see any sort of economic weakening at that time, but commodities were running, they wouldn't really be able to step in and, and lower rates at that particular time, which would put them in quite a pickle that is actually very similar to the great financial crisis. It's a very similar phenomenon. If you didn't know, oil spiked up massively right before the great financial crisis. And it caused the Fed at that particular time, right? I believe I believe it was Alan Greenspan back then. I think, was it Alan Greenspan? No, I think it is actually Ben Bernanke was Fed chair back then, if I recall. And it led him to be in this pickle where it was like, okay, uh, we got all commodities running. We got inflation maybe hotter than the Fed wanted it. But they couldn't really make a move there because commodities were insane. Oil went up to $140 a barrel in that whole situation, right? Now, and the reason this creates more ramifications is the longer the Fed has sustained an elevated place, right, the more and more the middle class gets squeezed. And the middle class gets squeezed by two things. So this is total debt balance. Now, this was as of the end of Q4 2023. I almost guarantee you these numbers are substantially higher right now than they are when this data came out here, okay? And we'll get more information probably in the next month around where the debt levels are now, it's almost a bankable thing that debt levels are higher right now than they were at this particular time. We're probably like 18 trillion, if not over 18 trillion, right? And so the middle class here is getting squeezed by inflation, right? You're looking at probably pretty high gas prices this spring. And, and if, if, gas pr if oil price runs in the, in the springtime, then we're going to be looking at super high gas prices in the summer, which is travel season, right? And obviously, you got all this other stuff with these, all these other commodities causing problems out there. And then you got also the middle class being squeezed by interest rates, right? If you go try to go buy a new home right now and look at your interest rate and look what your mortgage payment is, right? Go try to go buy a new car. Or if you've bought a new car in the last year or two, like you know the, the, the interest payments, credit cards, all those sorts of things. So you're the middle class getting really squeezed still by two things. And this sucks is the best way I could put it. It really sucks because... You know, it's like you're getting squeezed either way, really, in this whole situation, right? Now, I have a book by the side of my bed. It's a little messed up now at this point in time. Uh, I love this book, though, Mastering the Market Cycle, Howard Marks' book, right? And this book talks in, in depth about market cycles. And, you know, everybody always thinks when you're going through something, it's what's going to remain, it's what's going to stay. So let's say you're going through a uh, you know, high unemployment, like people just start to think like only high unemployment, it's like, or bad economy is all you're going to be in. If you're going through a good economy, low unemployment, people just think like, oh, that's the way it's going to stay. It's never the reality, though. Markets come and go, they go up and down. It's a roller coaster ride, right? And this book is one of my favorites ever. Oh, man, his B was trying to attack me. This book right here is one of my favorites ever. You know, I definitely have good things to say about that book in regards to making you really understand the market cycles, right? Now, here's how the story is going to end, okay? If you want to know the ending of the story, I'm going to tell you the ending of the story. And it always ends this way. So it's like watching a movie for this third, fourth, fifth, a hundredth time. The ending doesn't change. It's always the same. Here's how it's going to end, okay? We're going to have an unemployment recession. We're going to have massive debt defaults from consumers and from many other financial institutions. Banks will go under. Too big to fail banks will get saved. Assets will drop 20 to 50% for a one to three year span. The Fed will cut rates to zero or near zero and government will spend, spend, spend. Well, that, that's one consistent thing. We do know the government pretty much regardless of the economy always spends, 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 right? Now, the issue, the problem is when does that happen? And that's the hard thing to get right. A lot of people thought this, this story was going to end in 2023. It didn't. Now, people were pushed off to 2024. 
I doubt it. I doubt the story ends in 2024. 2025, 2026, it's an open door, right? But the story will end eventually here, and this will happen, right? It's, it's like anybody that's trying to predict something else is going to happen here in the story just doesn't understand history and how these things work in the end, okay? This, this story will end this way. But getting the timing right on that is good luck, okay? Because this could we could roll out to 25, we could roll out to 26, we could roll out to 27, before the stuff hits the fan, as they say, right? So in, in regards to me personally, I do my weekly buys, public account, Patreon account. I keep earning 4 to 5% on my cash, and I'm staying 20 to 30% cash until the show happens. Whether that show happens in 25, 26, 27, this year, whatever, I'm staying in that sort of cash level. Whenever the show does happen, I'll lower cash levels quite substantially whenever that story does happen, right? Now, you know, uh, somebody was, uh, was talking about me recently. I mean, people always make videos about me and things like that, which is always weird, but it, it is what it is. Like, I understand it gets views. Somebody was saying, uh, you know, Jeremy's an idiot for keeping any cash. He shouldn't be keeping cash. He's called me an idiot, right? He should be 100% invested, right? And, you know, so <laughs> if you're calling me an idiot, you're also calling Warren Buffett an idiot, okay? And, you know, no disrespect, but I don't think this, you know, anybody's on quite Warren Buffett level, okay? Warren Buffett's sitting on record amounts of cash right now, right? Every one of the biggest companies in the world sit on, you know, <laughs> ridiculous sums of cash. So I guess all these companies are also idiots for ever keeping cash around. Don't keep any cash around is what, the, you know, these people are trying to, to say. And that's just crazy talk. That's absolutely crazy talk. As any buddy that's super successful in this world, if you should be keeping a good amount of cash around, all of them will say, yes, you should be keeping a good. There's not one person that would say, no, you'd be 100% invested in the market all the time. Not one. So anybody that tells you different, believe me, they're not part of that class. Okay. They're not part of that class. Okay. So just keep that in mind. There's two groups that are dangerous in this sort of market we're in right now, in my personal opinion. One group is the folks that are all cash. These are folks that always think they're going to know exactly when the stuff's going to hit the fan and when the story's going to end, even though they've never seen this movie play out before. You don't know. Like we could, we could run another year, two years, three years in this movie before it comes to an end. Like it's going to come to an end and the ending will be a little sad, but you don't know when that is. And so to be all cash, and there's been a lot of these folks that have been all cash since, you know, 2022, that's a tough game to play. That's a tough game to play. The other group that's dangerous is the folks that are no cash, right? Or near no cash, because those folks just aren't set up in a very good financial position if they lose their job, if anything bad happens in their business, if you know, a whole bunch of ramifications happen. The market crashes, those sorts of things, right? And you could think, this, this shows you U.S. historical foreclosures over time, right, throughout different years. And, you know, 2005, 2006, 2007, a lot of people felt like the economy was great. Great times, everything's good, everything's fine, right? And you could have made the argument, who needs cash? Who needs cash, right? Well, cash was king. 2008 through 2011, cash was king. You had your pick of all the best assets in the world for very cheap prices in 08, 09, 2010, 2011. We're talking stocks. We're talking real estate. I mean, it was it was a platter. It was a silver platter given for you, right? And also, I want to point you out to right here. We've actually started an upcycle in terms of foreclosures, right? Bottom was in 21 right there, right? And this was a multi-year downdraft. We went down basically every year in terms of amount of foreclosures since 2010. That's over. The up cycle has now started at this point in time. 2024, don't be surprised at all if that number upticks quite considerably in terms of how many foreclosures happened in 2024. And whenever the unemployment story comes in, that's when you're going to see an epic amount of foreclosure activity at that particular time, right? And so that's a little food for thought in regards to that situation. So the setup isn't great here. Uh, we need commodities to come down. If commodities can come down, and we can have commodities chill, we're talking. We're in business, okay? If commodities don't chill, we're in trouble. And if commodities run all spring and then into summer, we're in a lot of trouble, okay? That's that. Second thing up here, let's talk about Tesla and Tesla. So numbers are coming out likely in the morning around Tesla's delivery numbers, okay? Now, this was consensus as of, uh, I believe it was Friday or Thursday. Consensus, 457,000 deliveries, Last year, they did 422,000. Now, it doesn't look very probable that 457 is getting hit, okay? It doesn't look very probable that 457 is getting hit. I don't know what other way to put it, okay? 
Now, very recently, Webb Bush took their numbers down to 425, Morgan Stanley down to 425, Deutsche Bank down to 414. My guy, who I would call pretty much a Tesla expert or pretty darn close to it, my guy's under 410, okay? So I don't know. I, I wouldn't say I'm not very excited about this delivery number. This is not one of those delivery numbers to be excited about. Let's just put it that way. My guy's under 410, which is under where even some of these bearish folks are on Wall Street. So we'll see what happens in regards to that, okay? But the next thing I want to say is all this is going to be irrelevant two to three years from now. Whatever happens with the stock price tomorrow, what happens in the delivery numbers, oh, it's worse than expected, oh, it's way worse than expected, oh, it's better than expected, whatever, okay? Probably worse than expected. It's all irrelevant two to three years from now. Irrelevant, right? I take you back here. Does anybody remember this quarter right here? This was 2017 into the 2018 quarter there. And Tesla's revenue actually, you know, it was a very small increase there which could have been seen as problematic. But you want to talk about ultra problematic? Right here, 2018, that particular quarter, that is $7.2 billion of revenue. And then in the March 31st, 2019 quarter, they dropped down to $4.5 billion of revenue. And it, it, an embarrassing, an absolutely embarrassing decrease in revenue year over year for Tesla. I mean, you know, what is that off the top of my head? That's probably high 30s, low 40s in terms of percent revenue down year over year? I mean, for a company like Tesla, that was embarrassing at that time. Does anybody even remember that quarter now? No. Anybody remember this quarter in 2019 into the March quarter of 2020? Before Rona, it even started rolling, right? You know, Rona really affected the, the next quarter more so. $7.3 billion went down to $5.9 billion in revenue. You know, bit embarrassing. Does anybody remember that quarter? What about this quarter when they went from 957 to 940? What about this particular quarter when they went 955 to 937? What about this particular quarter when they went from $1.2 billion of revenue to $1.1 billion? Does anybody remember these quarters from 2015? Or, you know, these quarters from 2017, 18, 19, 2020? No, of course not. No one remembers that. It's all just ancient history now at this point in time. So the, the moral of the story is in regards to a stock like Tesla. Everybody can get caught up into whatever. They want to sell the stock off 10% tomorrow. As a long-term investor, I just look at it as a buying the dip opportunity. Great. Give me give me shares. You want to sell me shares for 150, I'll give them. Like, you want to sell me shares for 120, 100, whatever. Okay? Give me the shares. This will all be irrelevant over time. We'll move past it, and we'll be what it's going to be. Okay? And all that matters at the end of the day is Tesla's three, five, seven-year trajectory. And gosh, look at Tesla's trajectory last three, five, seven years when it comes to their revenue. It's very impressive. It's very, very impressive. Deliveries, production, it's very impressive. This will all be what this is going to be. Now let's get into Palantir, my dear. And then we'll get a Nike and win, okay? So Palantir, this is since the, you know, uh, shortly after, you know, we can call it like the first week of February, right? So for about the last two months or so, right, Palantir stock's been going nowhere, and some folks are complaining about that, right? Palantir was very exciting there for a bit, and now people are complaining. The stock's so boring. It's not going anywhere. It's even downtrending here recently. So you got a lot of complainers out there now at this point in time that I guess expect Palantir to go up every day, okay? Here's the reality. In the last one year, Palantir stock is up 173 flip and flap jacking percent, okay? That's a holy smoke as this ain't no dang Jokers, 173%. Stocks don't go up every day. Even in this, even in this span of 173% in the past one year, you would think, oh, every month, every quarter, every day, week, this stock had to be up. No, look at this. Even in this 173% gain time, no, the stock had several downtrends. Right here, downtrend. Right here, downtrend. Right here, Big downtrend for quite some time there. Right here, downtrend. Right here, big dip downtrend, right? Big into the end of 2023, while a lot of the market was going risk on. People were buying, buying, buying. Palantir was actually downtrending during that particular time, while the rest of the stock market was having fun, right? And then recently, downtrend, right? And despite all those downtrends I just told you about there, it's still 173% gain in the past one year. Come on, man. Give me a break here, okay? And I really think the only two groups of folks that are, you know, frustrated with Palantir not moving 
or anything like that. It's traders and it's noobs, right? And I understand you're a trader. You got short-term calls on Palantir. You need the stock to pump and move and you need it over 27, blah, blah, blah. I understand, okay? Th those people are, they're, they're tourists in a stock. They're not in Palantir for the long term. They're not in Palantir because of what's going on with AIP or commercial commercial customer account. They're not in, in, in this, pro this company for Apollo and Gotham and, and everything they got going on in Foundry. They, no, okay? They're just playing this because it was a momentum play and they thought it would stay a momentum play and it didn't. So now they're frustrated. Now they're complaining, right? And the other people are noobs in the market that, you know, don't really know patience yet. And sometimes if you're a noob, you, you haven't been through it yet. You haven't had enough time to really be patient. I look at a stock and I'm like, if I've held a stock for less than a year, it's literally nothing. Never mind two months. Come on. If I've held a stock for a couple years, that's like nothing. I've, I have positions in a public account that I've held since 2018, 2019. They would be a lot longer, but that a, a portfolio started in 2018, right? So, I mean, you know, it could be 2030 some point, and I'll have stocks that I was still holding from the 2010s in that portfolio and from 2022 and from 2023 and 2030, right? And so patience, patience, patience. Like, you know, everybody wants stocks to just go up every single day. And I'm just like, whew, you know, let's get back to reality a little bit here. And that's why, by the way, that's why corrections in the market and crashes in the market are the best thing because it keeps everybody in reality mode that stocks don't just go up every day and you can't expect them to. And if you get frustrated because the stock go downtrending for a few months, or even a year, two years, like you're just not, you know, this game might not be cut out for you as an investor, right? Next up here, Nike. I want to speak about Nike for a moment here, and then we'll get into Wind Resorts and some great news in regards to when that stock's starting to move and groove, okay? First off, I reacted to five different video clips in today's reaction video on the Reaction channel, right? If you haven't followed me on there, Jeremy LaFave makes money, 43,200 subscribers now, right? And one of the videos was this gentleman, this analyst, talking about Nike's a buy, Lululemon's a buy. But he was kind of talking up. It kind of frustrated me as a Nike long because he was kind of trying to talk up Nike's numbers in the short term. Like, they're so good and this and that. And I'm like, no, they're not. What, what are we talking about here? These, these numbers are not good from Nike. And so I think the moral of the story is to understand, like, Nike's short term is crap. And everyone knows Nike's short term is crap. That's why the stock's down 14% year to date. It's not down 14% because the numbers are great or the guidance is great. It's because, you know, this is just kind of a, a reset year for Nike overall, okay? I love this stock, and I'm buying this stock actively because it's a buy for 2025 and beyond, right? And so I need to position into the stock before the move happens, before the numbers get great again, because the numbers aren't great right now. I don't know what that analyst was talking about in that video. The numbers aren't great for Nike. The guidance wasn't great for Nike. If you want to cherry pick a little data here and there, the short term is not there. The long term is there, in my opinion, for Nike. And I think we'll see that play out over time. And so I just, you know, that's why I love having the reaction channel because it gives me a chance to hear analysts, hear these different Wall Street folks, you know, put things and they just cherry pick this data and they try to, you know, and I'm like, no, no it's not like that, man. You know, like <laughs> Nike's numbers aren't good right now. I think they'll be great over the next few years, right? So, and by the way, you know, the middle class, when, when things do get better, better for the middle class, which, you know, I don't know when that is, whether that's a year from now or two years from now or six months from now or, you know, when things truly get better for the middle class and they're not being sliced and diced by inflation and interest rates, it's going to be a huge boom for Nike for like a 10-year span, okay? So, you know, imagine a recession hits. Let's just play it out, okay? Let's imagine a recession hits, I don't know, next year or something, okay? It might not by the way. But let's just say it does. Okay, recession hits next year. Uh, Fed has to start dropping interest rates. Unemployment goes up. Next thing you know, unemployment 7 8%. Hurts all companies in general in the short term. Fed drops rates to nothing. Economy starts to come back. Unemployment goes lower over many, many years again into the future, right? Inflation's not an issue for the middle class. Real wages can be in a decent place. And that would be like a 10-year boom cycle for a stock like Nike, okay? So, you know, got to have long-term vision in regards to some of these, right? The last one up here, Wind Resorts, some great news in regards to Wind Resorts. So this stock moved up over four percentage points here today. Great day for, for Wind, and it was also a good day for a lot of the other players. And so there's a few pieces of great data in regards to Wind Resorts, and this is going to benefit Wind huge in the short term, right? So Macau, March GGR numbers came out this morning. 
up 5.5% month on month to $2.4 billion. Casino gross gaming revenue in Macau rose by 5.5 percentage or percent month over month in March to just above $2.42 billion, according to data released on Monday by the city's Inspection and Coordination Bureau. That results was 53.1% higher compared to March 2023. It also slightly surpassed the previous post-Rona high. Okay, good, good, good. So we're at a new post-Rona high. We're still not back to pre-Rona highs, and that's the beautiful thing in regards to Macau. We're still got, we still got a game to play here, okay? And the game is we're going to catch up to pre-Rona numbers eventually, and then we're going to surpass those numbers, okay? Now, in Nevada, also, in my state, right, things are phenomenal. Uh, casinos report 8.5% growth to $1.3 billion in February. A busy month that includes the Super Bowl in Las Vegas, Chinese New Year celebrations, and an extra day produced strong Nevada gaming revenue across the board. Numbers were phenomenal, up 8.5% versus the same month a year ago. And these numbers will continue to be strong until the story ends, right? And once again, whenever that story ends, then, you know, Vegas will get rough for a period of time there and those sorts of things. Don't expect Macau to necessarily get rough when that happens, though. If you look back at Macau 2008, 2009, 2010, it actually did very, very well, okay? So don't expect one to affect the other or something like that, okay? Now, the other thing to remember, win-type customers are not the middle class, okay? So middle class getting hit, we talked about that, interest rates, inflation, Win customers are not the middle class. They are the top 10% of wealthy, of top 10% of in income earners, those sorts of folks, okay? So it's a whole different class. It's a whole different set of folks, okay? Now, Win was one of seven stocks I spoke about on the video I released two days ago. It looks like 43,000 you guys have gotten to see that so far. If you haven't got to check that video out, it's here on the main channel. So do enjoy that one. It goes into all seven stocks. And like I said, Win was just one of those seven stocks, okay? Appreciate you joining me as always. Don't forget, pin comment down there 13 days oh. until the one day sale April 15th the tax break jailbreak sale 69 bucks baby yeah it's a no joke it's holy smoke it's pin comment down there to uh, fill out that and also set up your Patreon account so you can get access to the deal that's free much love and have a great day